crew chief driver relationships were a big part of this race. And I thought you touched on something really interesting there, comparing it to Gabe Hamlin. And before we get into the drivers screaming at each other or uh, screaming at their teams, which we saw a lot of that in this race. Let, let's talk briefly about Gabe Hardham because I think you're right, Stevie, that Denny loves stats. He loves numbers. He loves that he's got the analytics guy in Gabe Hart. And we saw it in stage one in particular where Gabe Hart said, I don't care what anybody else is doing. We're going to figure this car out and we're going to go long uh, on our before making our first stop. Longer than anybody else. And at the end of the stage, Hamlin, I think, had a net gain of one position, but for a while it looked like he might not get any position, especially if like a yellow came out or something. And at the end of the stage, Hamlin's like, good job, Chris. That was a good strategy. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that tells you what you need to know about Hamlin Gabehart and, and why they kind of work well together. There's a lot of drivers that can't manage that strategy. When they come back on the racetrack, even with fresher tires, they lose their mind. Um, they scream about pinning too late. They scream about, they worry about everything except for driving the race car, which is what they should be worrying about. Um, and Denny Hamlin's the opposite. And, you know, it has to be so frustrating to sit out there on old tires, watching cars that you've beat all day long, zoom past you on new tires, knowing you're losing time, but this belief in one another. And I think it comes with great communication during the week, right? I don't know this to be true, but I can't believe, you know, Gabe Hart just dreamt this up and Denny just believed hundred percent. I think he was explained why it should work explain the math and then executed stage one was a net one stage two was a huge gain it was like four and a half five seconds faster than most other cycles uh it was a big gain in position now look there's a risk if you get a caution in the last 20 laps of that run uh the advantage is is um kind of gone away it's thrown out the window um it's negated and i think that's the risk you have to have and when that happens even game heart wasn't quite sure because then he said great strategy and he goes well i appreciate that but i'm not sure it was uh, but in stage yeah. two, they stuck to it. and It was good again. And actually, that's what we missed in stage three. Um, we talk about the Larson Blaney wreck. But I was so fascinated to see what the 11 did because it was a longer stage. Everybody was still shortening it. I actually think the 11 was in position to win that race. Um, how about this? I don't know who was going to win the race. But if it would have just cycled through, we were getting ready to have one of the most epic final 15 laps possible with old tires sliding and new tires chasing. Um, I know most people don't see that, but I like to skip ahead in the book. And the last chapter said that the last 15 laps was going to be amazing. Now we got a, still a great finish uh, with Bell trying to holding off a hard charging Ryan Blaney, but, but it was going to be a different feel for sure. Yeah. And it all changed again after the red flag for the Larson crash. And then you had Hamlin and Blaney battle and Hamlin. We don't really know what happened, but you know, some sort of part failure or flat tire hits the wall. I, it's out. not a flat tire. So I've watched this a couple no. times. So on the in car, you see a hitch in the wheel. So so when he gets all done, the tire has air in it. So I'm willing to say it's not a flat tire. I don't feel like it's a suspension failure because there's no bottoming out or sparking where the car makes a drop. I don't believe it's a steering mm -hmm. failure as far as a part breaking because if you watch his hands, um, and I know the listener can't see me, but your right hand, you know, so you're at 10 and 2. You turn down in the corner. Now your right hand is close to midnight, straight, straight up top. When you have a flat tire or steering brake, the wheel turns left. Your right hand continues to turn left even though the car goes right. If you rewatch the in-car, you get a shutter in the wheel left to right, but then his hands don't turn left. His hands stay in the same position as the car goes right. It's almost like a hydraulic issue. Uh, it's it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what they find out because I don't think the failure is as simple as a part breaking or air coming out. I think this is an internal mechanical issue. Um, hmm. So, you know me, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to the nuts and bolts. Um, so I'm going to let the pain settle a little bit, but I'm going to make sure I talk to Mr. Gabe Hart here, maybe Thursday or Friday of this week. And I'd love to see what he's willing to tell me. And I understand if it's nothing uh, because the steering is, is best is a very important part of this car that teams have found advantages on, but it, it, it was a very odd failure. And then a big hit. We didn't talk a lot about it because he kind of, drove it back around but that was a that was a tough hit at a bad angle yeah uh the right front and he went straight into it like you said gave, gave him no warning um and you're gonna be talking to chris gabehart gabehart wasted no time in talking to his driver um we caught it on the nascar nbc cameras so that was a great shot where gabehart essentially puts his arm around hamlin's neck and is whispering something in his ear for a good 20, 30 seconds. Um, I know you weren't privy to that conversation, but 
you probably have some insight on what a crew chief might tell his driver right after something like that. What do you think Chris Gabehart's message was to Denny Hamlin when he appeared, like you said, he, he was in contention to win this race, has it get away from him, no fault of his at, at all, and now has to regroup outside the cut line, going to Martinsville. What do you think Chris Gabehart did? Uh, well, you got to understand that, that, you know, Denny has been very bullish about his opportunity this year. He's, he's been very vocal that this has been his year and then it seems to be falling apart. And if I'm Chris Gabehart, I'm letting him know that before you even have time for negativity to set in, that we're gonna, we're good. We're moving forward. We're on to Martinsville. Like I would move the ball forward as fast as possible. I would take ownership that we've had an issue as the crew chief. Anything that happens on that race car is your responsibility. Even in these big corporations where you may not touch the part, you sign the dotted line. It's your car. And I think that's Chris taking you know, responsibility for the car. But if I was Chris, knowing how bullish Denny is, um, you know, we're talking a Hall of Famer with a championship lacking on the resume. I don't think the championship's going to define him. He's been very vocal about that, but he's also been very vocal that this is our year. And I would remind him that we knew there would be setbacks. Nothing has changed. And that would be as simple as that. I would let him know that if he thinks this car is sitting in front of us in the pit stall with the right front damaged, if you think this is going to define our year, then you're wrong. Then in six and a half days from now, we're going to the track that we run the absolute best at. And we're going to remind everybody why this is our year. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. And guess what? It's not easy. And that, I mean, that would have been the message. It would have been as simple as that. Um, because if you don't have that same, whatever you want to call it, but that same sort of approach, that same sort of we can walk through that brick wall approach, then I think doubt can kind of slip in, right? And Denny flies on his own. He's not with the team. There's going to be separation. He has to go to the infield care center. I don't know if I'm going to see him after the infield care center, right? I wouldn't allow any doubt to creep in. I would refocus the team right then, right there, that moment that we haven't even left pit road at Miami and we are on to Martinsville. Yeah, that's a great point. I haven't thought about that, that Hamlin actually hadn't been to the care center at that point. He was stopped at the pit stall before he had to go there. So that's that rare instance where a crew chief has the time to, to say something to his driver. And, you know, it certainly seemed like Gabe Hart and Hamlin are on the same page, whereas other drivers, it didn't seem like it was that way, Stevie. I mean, Christopher Bell kind of giving it back to Adam Stevens a little bit near the end of stage two, saying, OK, I'm just going to start trying harder now. He's a little bit snarky. and then. I know we keep talking about, it, but Martin Truex Jr. and James Small, uh, Truex got upset about another slow pit stop, um, and you know was yelling at his guys. Um, your take on that? And are you surprised that? And I know that we, you said it, you said it yesterday in the broadcast again that this is the mo of James Small, and Martin Truex Jr. They have this understanding, but at some point, is there a limit to how much a driver should be yelling at his team? Well, so the James Small Martin Truex thing, they're they're the um, you know, the couple trying to work through rough waters and there's no friends helping them. And and the pit crew, you know, no one on the team, no pit crew, like nobody's stepping up to make this easier. Right? Like it's already Martin will be the first guy to tell you, and James will agree that the, the strategy got him off last week. Um, you know, Martin and James joked about it when I talked to him in the pre-race on the radio, like, well, hopefully we'll get the strategy right, you know. But then you take a heated situation for the regular season champ who has had a debacle. I mean, their, their playoffs is as cold a streak as you can get on. Everything has gone wrong. And then you have unacceptably slow pit stops. I mean, I'll say it. Like, I don't want, here's the thing. Everyone's human. Everyone makes mistakes. And we aren't heart surgeons. We're not brain surgeons. We're not saving lives. It's just sports. But don't pretend that the best deserve to win. Everybody can't be the best. And you know what I saw? Pit stops that were not deserving to win. I saw pit. That's not an effort thing. That's nothing attacking mm -hmm. the character of those five people that go over pit wall. They are, I'm sure, working night and day trying to get better. But this is not, and you know, in today's polarized world, if you say somebody's not good, it's a personal attack. I'm sorry. That's not how sports work. I have the data. Mm -hmm. Slow. The answer is slow. The pit stops are slow. And they're slow when they matter. This isn't intramural football. This is professional sports. When the ball is dropped in the Super Bowl, do we go, 
but he's such a good guy running that route. You know, no, we say he <laughs> dropped the pass. So I, I'm sorry. Pick crew guys get paid handsomely to do their job. They have all the effort in the world and they have to step up on the big stage. And just like the drivers make mistakes and James Small made it a week ago when the pit stops were fine, this week it was pit stops. And and when you have a dry pile of leaves, which is this relationship or the 19 radio, and you start throwing sparks towards them, they catch on fire. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube channel.